God. Amen. Thank you. you. May be seated. You know what? I am very thankful for the five verse hymns that we have in this hymnal. <laughs> it gives me a little more time to get up to the balcony and down, and up to the sound room and down. So, take your Bibles and turn with me, if you will, to the book of Acts. Tonight we are in Acts chapter 2, verses 24 through 30, looking at part 2 of When I Want Your Opinion, I'll Beat It Out of You. Uh, the Apostle Paul is facing that as he is dragged into the castle by the chief captain, uh, who, with all authority of the law, makes uh, that threat against the Apostle Paul. We're in Acts chapter 22. I'll begin reading in verse 24. The chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined <laughs> by scourging. It's called waterboarding or, you know, torture it out of the prisoner. That he might know wherefore they so cried against him. As you are suffering uh, under torture, you tend to tell the truth to get out of the torture. And as they bound him with thongs, Paul said unto the centurion that stood by, Is it lawful for you to scourge a man that is a Roman and uncondemned? He doesn't um, tell them, you can't do this to me because I'm a Roman. He asks them a simple question, probably with a smile on his face. When the centurion heard that, he went and told the chief captain, saying, Take heed what thou doest, for this man is a Roman. Then the chief captain came and said unto him, Tell me, art thou a Roman? He said, Yea. And the chief captain answered, With a great sum obtained I this freedom. And Paul said, But I was free born. We have a bunch of people in various high offices, running for offices and so on, that there's a great deal of confusion about whether or not they were born as natural citizens or naturalized as citizens. Paul says, I was free born. Then straightway they departed from him that would have examined him, and the chief captain also was afraid after he knew that he was a Roman and because he had bound him. Romans had a lot of protections, not just freedom from scourging, but even from being bound without first having been condemned at a trial of law. On the morrow, because he would have known the certainty wherefore he was accused of the Jews, he loosed him from his bands and commanded the chief priests and all their counsel to appear and brought Paul down and set him before them. Gracious Heavenly Father, we pray that as we look into your word tonight, you will use your word to examine our hearts to show us where we have been bound by sin and legitimately so, but that Jesus breaks the bonds. We pray, Father, that you might help us to understand the things that are offensive to you may not be offensive to men, and the things that are offensive to men may not be offensive to you. Help us to understand the difference and be able to stand boldly for Christ and unashamed for the testimony of our Lord and Savior. Help us never to be ashamed of the things that the world wants to mock us for, but always to stand firmly for Christ. We commit this portion of Scripture to you and for our study of it tonight, that Jesus Christ might be glorified, for we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, you recall last week we looked at the second part of Resume and Revolution, and we talked about that's really the background for what's going on here in our text tonight. In fact, it is the very important background because Paul is using part of his resume <laughs> when he stands and speaks to the centurion. He's been speaking to the Jews in Hebrew. And we do not know how much Hebrew those guys understood, but they certainly understood the Apostle Paul spoke Greek and he spoke Latin and he spoke Hebrew, probably spoke Aramaic too. I mean, we tend to live in a mono lingual culture, but when you're in the Middle East, you run into people who speak four, five, six languages. I had a professor at the Hebrew University who fluently spoke five languages, and he spoke English very, very well. You know, he wasn't just stuttering along in English, but he was a Jew born in the land, raised in the land, and was very excited. He could pick up his Greek New Testament. I was taking a course from him in the work of the priest in the temple at the end of the second temple period, according to Mishnaic sources. That was the title of the course, believe it or not. I'd like to hear you say that back again. And um, part of the source material for his studies of the second temple period, which is the time in which Jesus lived, part of his studies were the Greek New Testament. And so he had learned Koine Greek, New Testament Greek. And he could pick up his Greek New Testament and read and translate into Hebrew. Don't be surprised that the Apostle Paul was multilingual. 
Uh, someday we may have to become multilingual also, just to get by. But anyway, so here's the Apostle Paul, and he's speaking now to the chief captain. He can speak Greek. He's already told the chief captain that. He's told the centurion that in the preceding verses. He obviously could speak Latin too, because that's what the Romans spoke. Now, we were looking at resumes. So Paul is using part of his resume here, and we noted that a resume may gain you a hearing, but it will ultimately not win a battle with a hostile audience. Now, Paul's got a different audience here in the text tonight. He's got an audience of Romans. He had an audience of Jews. Now he's got an audience of Romans. But here, they're following the law. Here, they're going to try to do things in the right order. The Jews weren't. They were busy going about trying to kill Paul on the basis of hearsay. And now he's got an audience with the Romans. It gained him a hearing. It may not necessarily win his hostile audience. And we see that the captain is, uh, chief captain is going to be playing some politics here in just a short while. But at least it got him the hearing. And it stopped the torture that was about to take place. We talked about those last week who hold themselves out as authorities when they have no authority because they have no recognizable external standard by which they are held accountable and they have no external standard by which the quality of their so-called resume can be tested. But Paul was a highly trained theologian. We've talked about that in great detail, so we'll not cover that again here tonight. But we noted that submission to the authority of others is a very difficult challenge for some men. In fact, for men in general. Let's admit it, guys. <laughs> for us, being under authority is a difficult thing. Uh, we don't like it. I mean, there are some kinds of men who are real wimps, and uh, you know, they, they live under authority because they can't do anything about it. But most of us uh, hackle. Our hackles come up when somebody tries to exert authority, especially somebody who has no authority. And we need to remember what Paul said in Romans 13, that all authority ultimately is from God. So those who usurp authority are actually in rebellion against God. Someone who has no authority and who tries to take authority over you is in rebellion against God because God ordains legitimate authority, and that's what Romans 13 is about. We noted that those who have high opinions of themselves and do not want to have someone who is in authority over them usually reject all the training, background, understanding, discipline that a man has gone through, and they think they have authority just because they're who they are. It took Jesus three full years to teach the disciples, and he was the master teacher. How much longer should it take a man to go through his training today in spiritual things? Lesson number two that we learned was you must follow up your resume with proof of ability. If you want to win points and convince others of your product, in this case, the gospel. And so we find, as it was with Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men, but they marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus and beholding the man which was healed standing with them, present proof of ability. They could say nothing against it. The proof is in the pudding. My mom used to tell me that. You can't just talk the talk. You've got to walk the walk. It's not enough to know theology. The question is, how has theology impacted your daily life? How has what you know transformed you and made you more like Jesus Christ? That is the whole end of theology. To transform your life, to conform you to the image of Christ, to renew your mind, to have you present your body a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by that renewing of your mind so that you can prove, that is manifest openly, what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. You show God's will by the way in which you live, not by what you believe in your head about the theology that you argue about. That's proof of ability. Raw head knowledge is dangerous both to you and to others because knowledge in theology without having a transformed life makes you proud and makes you critical of others. And Paul talks about it as knowledge puffeth up, but charity edifieth. It's what you learn after you know everything that really counts. Also, knowledge has to be exercised in love. Loveless knowledge will never approach the weaker brother or the less knowledgeable brother gently and try to win them with kindness or reasoned discussion designed to lead them to the truth. You'll simply torch them and walk away smugly and feel good about it. Theological knowledge makes you feel proud if it isn't transformed your own life and if it's not exercised 
in love. God guarantees he will shoot down that kind of pride. God gives us a list of the things that he hates. These six things doth the Lord hate. This is Proverbs 6. Seven are an abomination unto him. A proud look. That's the first one. A lying tongue. Hands that shed innocent blood. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that be swift in running to mischief. A false witness that speaketh lies. And he that soweth discord among brethren. We're going to talk about that one a little bit more tonight. Pride not only destroys you. Pride destroys your family. We talked about that last week. There are proud Christian men who can't understand why their children have rebelled against them. But the scripture makes it plain. The Lord will destroy the house of the proud. We saw that God's judgment is against proud nations as well as individuals. I gave you a number of passages on that. We saw that God can break into that. God can break into a proud, arrogant, biological or genealogical line. And we saw that with Moab. Multiple passages in the Old Testament talk about the pride of Moab. Apparently that was a very, very proud people. One of the sons of Lot by incest became the head of a nation which was a proud nation and God said he's going to destroy them but Ruth came from Moab God broke into that wicked genealogical line and saved a woman who I think is probably the woman described in Proverbs 31 as the virtuous woman clearly Solomon's mother Bathsheba was not the virtuous woman who he is describing who can find a virtuous woman for her price is far above rubies the heart of her husband thus safely trust in her so that he shall have no need of spoil the heart of her husband couldn't trust in her. She committed adultery with David. In summary, unless the knowledge of the Word of God transforms your life to be more like Christ, who had compassion on the ignorant of those who are going out of the way, your theology is empty. Christ did deal with vigor, with force, against the arrogant know-it-all theologians of his day. They had head knowledge, but they had not love of God for others. We look at Matthew 9, Matthew 12, Hebrews chapter 5 which says, who can have compassion, speaking of Jesus, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself is compassed with infirmity. We saw the character of Christ toward the unwashed masses was compassion and not arrogance, scorn. And I gave you many, many, many verses, about 20 different verses on Christ's compassion where he was not arrogant and he himself was God. Part of that is, of course, the picture that is given to us of the Good Samaritan in Luke chapter 10. A certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion on him. It's in the narrative of the prodigal son. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was yet a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. It's not only given by Jesus in the various parables and by the Apostle Paul in multiple different passages. Peter speaks of it in 1 Peter 3, 8. Finally, finally, I'm going to sum it all up for you, says Peter. Be of all one mind, having compassion one of another. Love as brethren. Be pitiful. Be courteous. Oh, how we need to learn that lesson. John speaks of it in 1 John 3, 17. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? You see, knowledge without love is worthless. In fact, it's dangerous. And love always demonstrates in compassion. Even with those who have fallen into theological error. Jude talks of that in Jude 122. And if some have compassion, making a difference. He talks about plucking them out of the fire as brands from the burning. Hating the garments spotted by the flesh, but upon them you have compassion. So that's the important question. Here's the important test. Has what you have learned theologically made you kinder? Has what you have learned theologically made you more gentle and more patient? And you put up with it for a long, 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 long time. There may come a day, and there does with God when the kindness and compassion turns into judgment, turns into a blast, turns into the chastening that we've talked about in the morning messages, but he is very long-suffering with us, and I hope I am with you, putting up with things for a long, long, long time. I hope you are with your children, with others with whom you work. 
Has it made you kinder, gentler, more patient? Has what you have learned theologically caused the fruit of the Spirit to grow in your life? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. You know the question, and I've asked it over and over. You say you're a Christian. How has it changed your life? I told you about some relatives that I have in my family, both by consanguinity and also affinity, that is, by blood and marriage, who can talk theology all day long but never have anything in their lives to show for what they believe. Some of them even refuse to work. Paul said, let that man starve to death. Well, that brings us to tonight. Backing up for just a moment as our running introduction, Lesson two was claiming knowledge and ability, and even having knowledge and ability is not the same thing as performance. Lesson two was performance. Resume number one gets you a hearing. Number two, performance has to be able to back it up. Paul had both. Peter and John had both. They were clearly following Jesus, who had both. To be a follower of Christ does not merely mean knowing orthodox theology. It means, in terms of practical life, putting your money where your mouth is. It means getting up and putting shoe leather to what you know. So, in our text tonight, we just read it a moment ago, Chief Command, Captain is commanding him to be brought into the castle, bade that he should be examined by scourging, that they might know wherefore they so cried against him. The first thing that obviously should jump to your mind as you look at that is, we see the law at harvest at work. In our text tonight, what you sow, you reap, even if you are forgiven for your past. Think about that for a moment. The Apostle Paul, what had he done in his past? You know, Paul had been forgiven. God was going to use Paul in a mighty way, but Paul is now going to go through the kind of things that he himself used to do. Paul had some things in his resume that were coming home to roost. He had beaten Christians, he had killed Christians, and he had done it with legal authority. Now and all through his ministry, he suffers in a very similar manner to that kind of suffering which he himself had inflicted. The chief captain is using legal authority here. Now he doesn't realize there's another uh, law, and that's why you have two attorneys who argue every case. One is for the plaintiff and one is for the defendant. Because there are two sides of it, and there is law, and one side is focused on this area of law, and one side is focused on this area of law. And the judge has to determine which is the controlling precedent which is the legal principle that solves the problem that we have in the case here. And Paul's going to come up with that. But we find the chief captain with legal authority is going to tie him up and beat him. Now, what happens is merely a threat with a repeat lesson. And Paul is able to use the legal machinery of Rome in his favor. The chief captain commanded him to be brought into the castle and bade that he should be examined by scourging, that he might know wherefore they so cried against him. Dear people, law of harvest is true. Now you may have sown some stuff in the past that is having repercussions in the present, even though you have been forgiven. But suppose in the past you had gotten on a drunken spree and had run over a child and killed the child. You can be forgiven for that. You can get sober for that. You can never take another drink in your life, but it does not bring the child back. There are certain temporal consequences to everything you do. God has built this world with cause and effect. There are results for choices that you have made in the past. And that should be a motivation for making correct choices now because you see that God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. They that sow to the flesh shall, not might, shall of the flesh reap corruption. They that sow to the Spirit shall of the Spirit reap life everlasting. There are certain continuing effects to all of our sin even after we're saved, even after we are forgiven. There are things that are part of our life resume that will still have an impact on our lives as we move into the future. That's what happened to Paul. 
God used him in a mighty way. And God used those things from his past to motivate him for a greater love for Christ because he understood the grace of God in his own life. But there were repercussions for the things that Paul had done and the choices that Paul had made that were wrong choices, made in a religiously zealot spirit, but they were wrong choices. And Paul was going to have to live with that for the rest of his life. You and I have to live with all those choices that we've made for the rest of our life too, because those choices put us on one path rather than this path, and down that wrong path, we might have made correct choices to get back where we should be, but as a result, we still have those other choices, many of them, thousands of them, thousands of them, thousands of them in our past. The question is, how will it affect our current service? Will it motivate us to have a greater love and zeal for Christ? Or will we spend all of our time moping and groaning about the things of the past. Some people are like that. Every time you talk to them, what they keep doing is bringing up, well, if this had happened, or if that had happened, if this had happened, so and so would still have this problem, you know, this this thing or that, you know. Dear people, you ask for wisdom day by day to make the choices. You can't do it on your own. Because every choice that comes along is going to be an impossible choice. So you ask God for wisdom, because only he knows the future. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is as a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. So instead of moaning and groaning about what you think were bad choices that somebody else made that affected you, and there are people like that, you may be one of them. Oh, they made bad choices. And look how it affected poor little old me. Get over it. You live in a sinful, fallen world. Your goal is to serve Christ. Forgetting those things that are behind and pressing forward, I reach toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Move forward. We're going to talk about moving forward in just a minute here, because the Apostle Paul certainly did. He didn't keep groaning about what he had done in the past. He used it as part of his testimony, but he didn't keep groaning about it. He didn't keep complaining about it. He didn't wish that somebody else had done something else instead of doing what they were doing to him. He moved forward. He picked up where God had him, and he said, for the rest of my life, I'm going to serve Jesus Christ with my whole heart, soul, strength, and mind. Are you doing that? Are you moaning and groaning about what somebody else did that affected your life in the past and how you wish they hadn't done it? Dear people, you will leave it, live a defeated life if you do that. A totally defeated life. Learn from what Paul did as he used his life resume to proclaim the gospel of Christ. Well, I got off the subject there for a moment. Lesson number three, remember your true resume may include some things of which you are later ashamed. Your true resume may include some things of which you are later ashamed. Paul witnessed the stoning of Stephen with approval and then went on to kill Christians himself. But even these things can be used by God to motivate you to greater zeal when you understand the true nature of forgiveness you understand that why God allows sin in your life in the past God could have stopped it all God could have cut you off with a stone wall every time you tried to sin in the past he could have he's sovereign God could have, have, have put a dropped a, a block of steel between you and that sin Say, ooh, God's up there, isn't he? Mm, better not do that. And he could have done it and cut you off at every corner. He didn't. Because, you see, God wants you to understand the full extent of forgiveness and use these things in your past 
to motivate you to have zeal for Christ, to give your whole life for Christ when you understand what He has done for you. What a gracious God. That is grace, folks, when God does that. Paul talks about it as he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1.12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. So this is going to be a passage dealing with thanksgiving. Paul's going to give thanks for something. I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Three things Paul talks about there. Before he talks about his resume. So I really thank God for this. He's enabled me. You know what that is? That's the empowering of the Holy Spirit. Did you know that when you became a Christian, it didn't matter what you had done in your past? God gave you as his free gift the indwelling, empowering spirit of God to live inside of you for all the rest of your life. Is that a pretty big gift? doesn't matter what you've done in the past. The moment you trusted Christ, that is one of God's great promises to us. The Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us. That's what Paul's talking about. He enabled me. Before Paul was dead in trespasses and sins. Before you were dead in trespasses and sins. Before I was dead in trespasses and sins. But the Holy Spirit came in. He gave us life. He enabled us. He empowered us. He gave us spiritual gifts by which we can minister to the rest of the body of Christ. He enabled me. And then look at this next one. For that he counted me faithful. You say, man, if I, if I was looking down the row and uh, looking for people who were faithful, would I choose Paul? I mean, you think about Paul in his unsaved state. I mean, he was zealous and he was a religious bigot. God says, I'm going to count him faithful. When I put him into my army, He's going to be one of my most faithful soldiers. He counted me faithful. In fact, Paul says he put me into the ministry. Paul didn't choose it. God put him there. You know, if you get assigned to a task, if you're in the military, and if you're assigned to take a certain hill, and you take your platoon of men, and you head toward that hill, you don't say, you know, that's a pretty tough hill. Why don't we stop here at the bar before we get up to the hill? Or why don't we try to take that hill where there aren't quite so many enemy over there? Let's do that one. Uh, we know the captain told us to do this one, but let's do that one. How long do you think a soldier in the army is going to last like that? You do what you're called to do, and Paul says, God put me into the ministry. Was it an easy ministry? No. But Paul's background for that, in putting him into that ministry, going back to the law of harvest where we started, because Paul would understand, since he had done it himself, what it meant to suffer for Christ. God says, what you sow, you're going to reap. That was in your unsaved past, Paul, but what you sow, you're going to reap. There are continuing repercussions and continuing impact of what you've done in the past, but it's designed to make you more faithful for Jesus when you see what you've been forgiven for. More zealous to do the master's service. Ah, the chief captain's threatening him with that. You know, there are those things that Paul had, and it says, and it tells you the next verse. Here are three things Paul says God did for me. This is wonderful. But look, he gives you part of his resume. Verse 13, who was before a blasphemer. Now, wait a minute, Paul. You served the God of Israel, didn't you? Yes. You worshiped the temple, didn't you? Yes. You kept your vows, didn't you? Yes. You were a strict little good Jewish boy, weren't you? Yes. But you know what? He cursed the name of Jesus before his salvation. Before he was a blasphemer. Can you remember the point of your salvation before you were a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief we're going to talk about different things that bring shame tonight and one of those is doing stupid things for which you ought to be ashamed Paul says 
I was stupid. I did it ignorantly in unbelief. A lot of things that we do, we do in unbelief, don't we? We talked about that some this morning too. <laughs> some things that we know we should be doing, but when we do the opposite, it really proves we don't believe that there is a God who will spank us for it. Talking about judgment this morning and chastening. And then verse 14, now we see Paul's, why Paul is thankful. The grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love which is in Christ Jesus. You know, it's not enough to be on the right track theologically. Faith and love, we've already talked about that connection, haven't we? One place it's found in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. It's only when we realize the pit from which our slimy rock has been dug that we can give this kind of thanksgiving. The pit from which our slimy rock has been dug. That's why Paul speaks of God's mercy to him. Why he is so zealous for Christ. He understands from God's perspective that he was on his way to hell when God rescued him. Paul could have died in his sins and been a zealot for Judaism, rejecting its Messiah, and would be burning in some of the hottest places in hell today. And Paul understood that. You and I could be the same. I look at myself and I say, Lord, why did you choose me? Many times I've broken down in tears after I've read some scripture or, or heard a hymn with great, great expression of the mercy and grace of God. And I've wept and I've said, Lord, I don't deserve it. But I sure thank you for it. You saved me. I should burn. I should burn. But you saved me. A faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. Now Paul explains why God saved him. Why he went through all of those times in his life where he was a persecutor and injurious and a blasphemer. Albeit for this cause I obtained mercy. Why did God give a guy like that mercy? Did he deserve it? No, he didn't deserve it. But God had a reason for giving that kind of a guy mercy. And he has a reason for showing mercy to you too. For this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. There are three things here in this text. Three reasons. Number one, that Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. Now I've talked to you about the difference between patience and long suffering. Patience is putting up with difficult circumstances. Long suffering is putting up with difficult people. They are two different words in Greek and they have two different meanings. Patience deals with circumstances. You go through it and you tough it out, you grit your teeth, you bear under it, and you grin. Paul had some of that too, quite a bit. But long suffering that's part of the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit who indwells you, who enables you. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering. That's putting up with difficult people. Goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. God had long-suffering to Paul. Then he says, for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe. A pattern. Some of you may have had... Um, a drafting course or some course as you were going through high school that was preparing you for trade school or something else where you had a light table or maybe you were in an art course where you had a light table I had I, I went through many, many different art courses and uh, actually took some drafting too and things like that and uh, a light table is a really cool thing to have I love the light table because what you could do is you would put the original down on the glass and the light shone up through the original and then you would pay, put your paper on top of it and you didn't even have to be a good artist. You could, you could 
you know, you tape that paper down, the first one, then you tape the second one down on top of it, and then just carefully with your pencil, you trace the outline because the light is shining through the pattern that is underneath up through to the paper where you are, and you can copy it onto your paper. That's the word that Paul's using here. When he says, I am a pattern for them that should hereafter believe, He's talking about precisely the same thing where as they look at Paul's life, as they see the way God's grace and God's mercy worked in Paul's life. And part of that is here in our text tonight. He's a pattern. He's a pattern of the law of harvest. He's a pattern of zeal for Christ. He's a pattern of understanding forgiveness and that transforming his life. And the last part is what's the purpose of the pattern. It's not merely so that God could work in Paul's life, though God is doing that. It's not merely so that Paul could be a standalone individual out there that we all admire and say, wow, that, that's really great, but it's irrelevant to me. The third part is it applies to us. You look at Paul and you say, here is an example that is supposed to transform my life. He's a pattern so that I can copy down the lines along the surface here, he's underneath, the light is shining through Paul, the light of the gospel, the light of Christ is shining through Paul, and when I put my picture, my paper down there, I can trace those lines. It's for them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. That's why those things happened to Paul. That's why God didn't stop Paul from all the horrible things that he did in the past. Because God said, I want to show you what it means to have forgiveness. I'm showing it to Paul, but I'm showing it to you. I want you to understand what it means to experience grace. Paul experienced it, but I want you to understand it. To those who should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. You know, some of those things that Paul did, he was ashamed of. He was a blasphemer. He was a persecutor. He was injurious. But he didn't try to hide them from his resume when they were a useful tool because they were the proof of the grace of God. Now, you don't have to answer this out loud, but answer it in your heart. Do you have some things that you are ashamed of that you would not want to put on your resume of life experiences and hand out to other people? Do you? I do. I think you probably do. God hasn't called you to reveal every sin that you've ever committed. That's not the point of this passage. Because there are some things that should not be spoken of publicly. And you know, when, when I was growing up, I grew up in a denomination where they gave lots and lots of public testimonies. And everybody looked forward to that because then they could find out all the horrible things that people had done. That was exciting, man. And, and you know, people reveled in that. And the, and the ones who got up, they talked about their sins and they talked about the details of their sins. And, you know, the ex-press prize fighters who you know, got drunk and got into all these brawls and massacred people. And I mean, ex-prostitutes getting up and talking about all their experiences as prostitutes and things like that. You know, an ex-prostitute giving a testimony about her sexual activity. Some churches are big on that that excite the audience. God hasn't called you to do that. Example, you don't need to know all the specific decadent acts that sodomites do and how they perform them. Although God can save sodomites, and he does. First Corinthians tells us that by his grace. He can transform their lives without you having to know the details. And if God wants to reveal those things in eternity, he will do it at the judgment seat of Christ. But for now, it's shameful to talk about those things, to describe them, to say, well, what exactly do they do? Ephesians 5.11, have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them, for it is a shame even to speak of those things which are done of them in secret. You don't sit around and gossip about them and think, do you know what he did, and do you know how he did it, and with whom he did it? It's a shame even to speak of them. Now let me pause, because everybody will say, oh, good. No, there are some exceptions to uncovering immorality. That's part of the responsibility of elders in the church, for example. And Paul says so over in 1 Corinthians 5, we quoted you that passage this morning. Where was a guy living in incest with his father's wife. And Paul says, I should be made public to the church and you should 
put him on trial, and you should turn him over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the day of Lord Jesus. It was a Christian who was doing it. It was somebody who was really saved, because his spirit's going to be saved in the day of Lord Jesus, but his flesh is going to be destroyed by the devil. The church turns him over. Yes, there are certain exceptions where that kind of thing has to be uncovered so that it will stop the sin, so that it will cut off the immorality in the church, so they'll excise it completely, like removing the leaven from the lump, because otherwise it spreads through the church and all kinds of people are involved in that kind of junk. Yes, there are some exceptions. For example, a father must diligently investigate the moral purity of a man who is interested in marrying his daughter. Dads do that. I've done that. You wouldn't believe the grilling that I've given to the men who are my sons-in-laws. The dad must investigate with all due diligence to uncover anything that would disqualify an interested suitor. Men expect to go through it if you've got a godly dad. Girls expect to go through it if you've got a godly dad. Anything that would spoil the moral purity of his daughter. But normally it's not your business to be a busybody in other men's matters and try to worm the juicy tidbits of gossip out of other people, even if past sins are part of their life resume. So why does God allow bad things that would spoil our life resumes? Why does he allow it? Paul tells us why God allows the bad things on our life resume so that he gets the glory because only he is good and so that nobody can boast in his presence. That's why God says, I will let those things happen in your life so that you will not boast about how good you are. 1 Corinthians 1, 26 and 27. For you see your calling, brethren, how that not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God hath chosen the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. And God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And the base things of the world and the things which are deceived despised base things that means the stuff that's down in the rubbish and the mud the things which are despised everybody looks down their nose at it those are the things that God has chosen yea the things which are not to bring to naught the things that are and here's the reason that no flesh should glory in his presence and now we see the grace of God reaching down to the base things, to the despised things, to the things that are nothing, the nobodies, in verse 30. But of him are you in Christ Jesus. But of him are you in Christ Jesus. Who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption that according as it is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. See, that's what Paul's doing. Paul did it in front of the Jewish audience. Paul does it in front of the Romans. Paul's going to later do it in front of kings because God has set him apart to actually reach those who are in positions of royal authority. That's why God let him go through all those difficult times and why God is allowing him to suffer because there is the law of harvest but it's also to prepare him for reaching people who desperately need the grace of God. And he can say, I understand that because God took his grace and he reached down and he pulled me out of the slime ball pit, my greasy rock, cleaned me off and set me on a rock and puts a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Dear people, instead of feeling sorry about the past and indeed there are some things that you need to feel sorry for which are shameful but remember the grace of God reached down and pulled you out and remember the promise in Hebrews he's spoken of the blood of bulls and goats and all the sacrifices of the Old Testament Hebrews 9 14 If the blood of bulls and goats sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? We not only have forgiveness of sins through the blood of Christ, we have the cleansing of the conscience. Some people never want their conscience to be cleansed. They want to keep hanging on to it and boo-hooing and feeling sorry and weeping and groaning and moaning and never getting into service 
because they're so busy enjoying feeling bad about the past and thinking, oh, well, then I don't have to do anything for Jesus because look at my bad past, and so I can get away by sitting on the sidelines and letting everybody else do it. No. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The blood of Christ is designed to cleanse your conscience so that you can serve. There are continuing consequences, we understand that, in the temporal realm. I gave you the illustration of running over a kid while you're drunk many, many consequences to our temporal decisions. Marrying somebody that you shouldn't have married, there are continuing temporal consequences to that. There are many things that you do in this life that have continuing temporal consequences, but the blood of Christ can purge your conscience for the purpose of service. How exciting that is. I hope, I hope it excites you. It excites me. As it is written... He that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. You see, shame is a powerful motivator when it's used the way that God wants it to be used. There are three areas of shame that a Christian faces. I'm going to talk about one that I just mentioned a moment ago. The first is there are some things that we're ashamed of that were merely stupid. When we did it, it was stupid. It wasn't necessarily sinful, it was just stupid. Because... When we feel that kind of a shame, that's embarrassment to our pride. The, the sin is not what we did. The sin is that we were embarrassed because we're proud. And God says, I'm going to get rid of your proud. I'm going to let you do some stupid things. Because when you do the stupid things and other people laugh at you, then <laughs> that will help get rid of what's really the root sin, which is pride. You'll be embarrassed. You know, when you face that kind of thing, forget it and move on. I'll give you an illustration of my own life. A number of years ago, probably 15, 20 years ago, I don't remember exactly when it was, um, one of the former teachers that I had out at Stony Brook School for Boys, he was an elderly gentleman, a man from whom I learned an awful lot. He was a real outdoorsman, a real woodsman. He taught us all kinds of camping things. And uh, every Saturday evening, he would hold a cookout for the boys who didn't want to eat in the dining room, but actually wanted to go out and cook their own food. And so... I happened to be one of the guys that enjoyed doing that, and he had invented a little thing which he actually patented, which was a portable stove that would actually fold flat uh, where you could use it and it reflect. You could bake things on it. It was really cool. His name was Pearson Curtis, and he's with the Lord now. Uh, he died many years ago. He was an old man when I was a high school student. But I went to his funeral out at Stony Brook, and you know I did something very stupid. I was a young pastor at the time, but I, I did something that was very stupid. I should have known better. I wandered in and the chapel was full. So I just sort of wandered down the front and sat in one of the rows. And um, a couple minutes later, the, f the service hadn't started yet, a couple minutes later, uh, one of the teachers at the school who later became a headmaster came up and tapped me on the shoulder and he said, we're reserving this row for the family. <laughs> Did I feel stupid or what? How many of you think I felt stupid? Come on, raise your hand. Of course I felt stupid. You know, I felt shame. Here I was in front of all these guys who I'd grown up with, and they're now adults, and they've got their families and all this kind of stuff, and the chapel is packed, and I didn't know where else to sit. And so I just said, wander down. Because I'm one of these people who says, don't be a back row Baptist. No. Oh. See anybody up here? In hmm. <laughs> you guys must all be Baptists. Everybody's sitting in the back tonight. Uh, and I, so I'm never ashamed to go up and sit in the front. I'm happy to do that. Besides the fact I'm starting to get deaf, and that way I can hear better. But you know, it was a stupid thing to do. I wasn't thinking. That's the first kind. There are things of which we're ashamed that were merely stupid. Embarrassment to our pride. Answer is, forget it and move on. Number two. There are some things of genuine shame, genuine shame that made us ashamed, but have been forgiven. If we have confessed them and repented of them, things that are sinful, things that offend the holiness of God. They're not merely stupid, they're sinful. Things like theft and immorality and things like that. The third kinds of things that are in the areas of shame that a Christian faces, the third thing are some things that if we don't deal with them in the way that God commands, listen carefully, we will be ashamed 
at the return of Christ. Oh, we don't want to be ashamed at his coming. Jesus talks about that, Matthew 24. Paul talks about that. John talks about that. Peter talks about that. There are some things for which some Christians will be ashamed at his coming because they have not dealt with sin the way God says it needs to be dealt with. They've put off dealing with it. They're sort of like Samson who put off dealing with his sin until it was too late. He wished not that the Spirit of God had departed from him. And he was blinded. There are some Christians who are spiritually blinded because they have seared their consciences for so long that when Jesus comes back, they'll get the shock of their lives. They'll be ashamed at his coming. Not enough just to confess it. It's sort of like the Catholic concept of confession. You go to the confessional booth once a week and the priest says after you've given him a litany of sins and you always leave the big ones out, you only list the little ones uh, because he gives you a carte blanche where everything is forgiven and he says, my son, your sins are forgiven. You think, good, I didn't have to tell him that, but I got my sins forgiven. And you go out and you go do them all over again. Uh, yeah, wrong kind of confession because true confession is followed by repentance, not to be repented of where you say, the grace of God has forgiven me for my sins. Now I am motivated to live a holy life for Christ. Genuine repentance is a 180 degree turn from what way you were going to the exact opposite way. You were going south, now you go north. You were going east, now you go west. Repentance, metanoia, to turn about, make an about face. A change of life. You can confess it, but if you don't repent of it, you will be ashamed of the coming of Christ. Be thankful that, to God when he allows you to be put through shame for legitimate reasons. You know, going through that kind of shame, when God puts you to legitimate shame for legitimate reasons, it's a cause for thanksgiving. Because he is using shame to burn out the garbage in your life, to conform you to the image of Christ. And in that way, shame can be an intense blessing to cause you to live the rest of your life for Jesus Christ. Did you get that? Shame can be an intense blessing to cause you to live the rest of your life for Christ. That's what happened to Paul. That's why he's able to use his resume here before the Jews and before the Romans and ultimately before emperors because the shameful things of his life. He was a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious. He was a goody two-shoes, but he was on his way to hell. And he wanted everybody else to understand he not enough to be a goody two-shoes if you reject Jesus. And that gave him an intense motivation. Those things were shameful. You may not count them as shameful, but they are shameful. It was the motivation that moved Paul to give everything he had for Jesus. Is that how God has used shame in your life? Or do you simply try to cover it over and excuse it and make excuses for it? And talk about how good you really think you are and it really doesn't matter what you did and it really wasn't all that bad and all blah, 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 blah. Or do you realize how filthy you were and the grace and mercy of God extended to you and reached down and pulled this slime ball rock out of the pit and cleaned it off. Sin had separated you from a holy God. You were on your way to hell and God rescued you. And that motivates you as you understand the forgiveness and grace of God. That motivates you to say, Jesus, I owe you everything. I owe you everything. The rest of my life I dedicate to you 100% in your service, wherever you call me, wherever you put me. You have empowered me. You have enabled me by your spirit. You have gifted me. How am I supposed to use what you've given me for Jesus Christ? Because someday I will give an account to him for the things that are done in this body. I have part of a resume that's no good. But God used that part of my resume to motivate me to serve Christ and to be a pattern for others so that they could see God can forgive even a sinner like me. 
How are you doing with it? Our time is up. I want to talk about the things that we do not need to be ashamed about, things that transcend our life resume, things that others want to bring us to shame for, but God says it is not shameful. But we'll have to save that for next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, once again, we thank you for your word and for its power and for the grace of God, for the mercy of God, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Scarcely for a righteous man will one die, but God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Is that not a motivating factor to live all the rest of our lives for Jesus? Or do we think so highly of ourselves that we think we deserved it? And that's no reason to live for Jesus. After all, we're pretty good and we're just sort of puttering along in life and having a good time. And we'll get to heaven. We've got our fire insurance policy. We're not going to end up in hell. But what we give up, what we lose in terms of our heavenly rewards, the chasing that we must go through so that God can burn out the dross from our lives. Father, we pray that you'll take and use your word as we have studied it tonight to the glory of your Son, Jesus Christ, and help us to understand that grace motivates us <coughs> to total Christian living, to abandonment to Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing